elements. And there were questions about how you find the resources. And so I've uh, done some screen captures. This is the way I get in. Uh, I type uh, www.iris.edu. And then uh, this page appears. And you'll see here education. I click on that and uh, get this uh, sub panel. Then I'll click on lessons and demonstrations. And this panel will come up on my computer when it first comes up, demo and lessons is toggled on and everything else is grayed out. So I untoggle demo and lesson and then course, oops, I'm sorry. And then course uh, is uh, becomes uh, a, 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 an item that you can click on. So when you click on course, this comes up with my uh, mugshot there, and then the list of the uh, various lessons. So if you clicked on uh, lesson one or two or three, it would uh, bring up materials uh, associated with that particular topic. And so if I clicked on lesson one, uh, I can click here on the green uh, bar, and that will download all of the files. Uh, for lesson one, there's about uh, five or six. Um, they're all either PowerPoint or Word documents. And since lesson one has already been recorded, uh, Danielle has uh, a link here where you can bring up the video. Okay, so for lesson one, this is a list of the uh, files. So um, the main lecture, uh, it has the LEC after the 01. Then we have a Word document. Uh, this would be the exercise, and lesson one only has one exercise. This is a PowerPoint that introduces the exercise. So if you don't like reading a Word document, you would rather see a PowerPoint with animations. Uh, this is something that a professor or lecturer could use in a course. A classroom setting. Uh, the solution uh, uh, is usually a PowerPoint for this particular exercise. It's a Word document. And then there's also a file that talks about how to run the exercise, uh, what uh, type of uh, timing it might take. There are some terms for usage. It is on the uh, web page. The materials, uh, the lectures, the exercises, the words, the images, are intended for university student training only. Uh, professors and other teaching staff may use these uh, either in their entirety or uh, they can uh, pick and choose. They're uh, permitted to modify it. The only uh, condition is that if something has a copyright symbol that that uh, copyright information is carried along. Uh, university students can use these materials to train themselves at their own pace. Uh, this could be done uh, individually, or if you have an AAPG or an SEG chapter or a geology or a geophysics club, uh, you wanted to meet as a group and go over some of the lessons, uh, that would be uh, perfectly okay. Uh, industry professionals can only use it in uh, one situation. And that is if they're making a presentation either at the university or perhaps the high school level and that they're doing it as a volunteer. Uh, in other words, not getting any type of uh, compensation of salary or stipend. Uh, these materials are not intended to be used to train people who are already employed either within their own company or by contracting somebody uh, outside that would come in and use these materials. So how might these uh, resources be used? Uh, I've uh, touched on these, uh, these uh, four points. A professor or a member of the teaching staff could use them to um, uh, include in an existing course or perhaps develop one or two courses on petroleum geoscience. A university student might use these materials to, in a self-study manner. Uh, a group of students might get together and uh, have a uh, teach ourselves session. 
or and the uh, fourth possibility is a industry professional can use these but only as a way to help students understand what we do in the petroleum industry. I also wanted to thank ExxonMobil. I mentioned this uh, last week. Uh, so how exactly has ExxonMobil played a part? In my uh, 32 years of service with Exxon and then ExxonMobil, I developed and taught a lot of in-house material. Uh, uh, the materials were not just my own, but uh, fellow colleagues at ExxonMobil. During my last five years, uh, Exxon gave me permission to uh, use these materials outside of Exxon in order to give uh, short courses for students. Uh, then the material was released so it could be put on the web. Originally, they were on the AAPG website. Uh, they have been... Uh, uh, updated and expanded uh, considerably uh, and will uh, be now on the IRIS website. And in the last four years since I retired from uh, ExxonMobil, I've done a lot of updating and expanding uh, and that forms part of the materials that you'll see on the IRIS website. So I think we all owe a big uh, debt of gratitude to ExxonMobil for their permission to allow me to use uh, some of their materials for this online resource. So that's enough of uh, the logistics and background. Let's get on to the topic for today, and that is uh, introduction to play elements. So there are various ways in which people can find oil. One way we can prospect or look for oil and gas based on lady luck. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, we should drill here uh, the picture uh, of the gentleman, uh, he's holding what's called a divining rod. Uh, these were somewhat popular in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, and he would get uh, people uh, to invest. He would walk around, and when the divining rod swung downwards, that was where they decided that they should drill. Another way to uh, find oil and gas is to play a trend. So perhaps we have uh, three fields that are lying along a northeast or south, northeast to southwest trend. And maybe what I want to do is drill uh, along that uh, trend, either further to the northeast or further to the southwest, hoping to find uh, an extension of the uh, series of fields. Another method uh, that was used in the early days was to look for surface anomalies, uh, high points or hills. And if there was a hydrocarbon seep uh, around that hill, that was uh, even more ev uh, evidence that it might be a good place to drill. And so people would drill surface anomalies or surface highs. Uh, the fourth method I list here is subsurface interpretation. Uh, that's where we try to get an understanding of the geology underneath our feet. And based on what we learn and understand, uh, we try to find places where we think the conditions are right for oil and gas to be found. And of these uh, four, I am uh, very biased, but I think number four subsurface interpretation is a better way to go. So what do we need for success? Uh, Rube Goldberg is a gentleman who lived in the uh, early part of the 20th century. Uh, he was famous for drawing diagrams. Uh, he would have something that would perform a fairly simple task, but it was a very elaborate contraption that would do that. And if you've ever played or know about the board game Mousetrap, that is a Rube Goldbergian uh, uh, system. So uh, as I recall, uh, you build the board, uh, you build the contraption moving pieces around the board, and then eventually somebody turns a crank which moves an arm that has a boot at the end of it. The boot knocks over a basket, the basket has a ball, the ball goes down a spiral ramp and something else happens, something else happens and eventually the basket comes and catches the mouse. So if Rube were here and I said, Rube, what do we need to have success in terms of finding oil and gas? Uh, the first thing he would say is, Fred, you need a kitchen, a place where organic material gets cooked. 
And then you need a container someplace in the subsurface where the oil and gas is going to collect and it'll be in conditions where we can stick a pipe in and suck those uh, molecules of oil and gas out. And since the uh, kitchen and the container are usually separated uh, in space and in geological time, we need some plumbing so that we can connect the uh, kitchen to the container. And of course, we have to put the well in the right location. But uh, if we do happen to have a kitchen and it's cooking organic material and we have plumbing and it gets into a container and we hit the container with our well, then oil comes out of the ground and money goes into the bank. This is actually an anti-Rube Goldbergian display because it's taking something that is quite complex and it's oversimplifying it. Let me be a little bit more technical. Uh, the kitchen, what we talk about is a source rock and a source rock that is generating molecules of oil and gas. We also need hydrocarbon migration paths. And for the container, we need three elements. We need a reservoir quality rock. We need a trapping geometry in the subsurface. And we need a sealing lithology over that trapped reservoir so the hydrocarbons don't percolate up to the surface and we have something like the La Brea tar pits. Uh, I must point out that uh, this diagram and our discussion today is for conventional reservoirs, uh, not for unconventional or resource plays. So for the kitchen, we need a source rock. We need organic rich material, uh, usually organic rich shales. Those uh, rocks have to have the right temperature pressure burial conditions so that we start a process, a geochemical process of converting the raw organic material into oil and gas. For the container, we need a reservoir, a rock that is porous and permeable so that we can produce fluids out of it or drain the reservoir. The most common reservoirs are sandstones, or coarser plastics and certain types of carbonates that have that can have good porosity and permeability. For the trap, we need a three-dimensional configuration that will pool or collect the oil and gas. Those can be a purely structural trap like an anticline. They could be a purely stratigraphic trap, such as the pinch out of a nearshore sand or we can have traps that have a structural component and a stratigraphic component, those combined traps. And then we need a seal. We need rock that prevents leakage out of the trap. Migration occurs primarily through buoyancy. And so uh, we need uh, something that uh, keeps the gas from rising uh, through the reservoir up towards the surface and the same uh, keep the oil from rising too high. The most common uh, seals are shales, and uh, extensive shales such as marine shales uh, are, are uh, very good seals. And any type of evaporite, uh, salt deposit, is an excellent seal since uh, evaporites have extremely low permeability. And that trap has to exist at the top of the trap Let's say it's a structural trap at the top of the anticline, and it has to extend down the sides of the trap far enough that the collection of oil and gas is big enough to be economic. And again, I'll mention that uh, all of this is for conventional reservoirs, conventional plays. For plumbing, we need hydrocarbon migration. We have to get the molecules of generated oil and gas out of the shales and into the porous uh, reservoirs. As I mentioned, the primary mechanism is buoyancy. The lightest uh, molecules within the pore space will rise the highest. So gas will displace oil and oil will displace water. I'll show some diagrams about that uh, in uh, a couple minutes here. Some of that migration may be parallel to the stratal layering, uh, making use of sand layers or silt layers. For a strata parallel migration, we do not need reservoir quality rock. 
because uh, typically we have millions of years for the molecules to uh, percolate through the rock system. Some of the migration may cut across the strata, moving up fault zones or through fracture networks. So here I have a, a diagram of a cross section through a basin. Uh, the, uh, kind of uh, granitic sort of uh, pattern down here is meant to be basement or hard rocks. And then I believe there are 13 colored layers which are meant to represent sedimentary rocks. The first thing we have to do is figure out where exactly would oil and gas be generated. And our geochemists have software that if their uh, seismic interpreter can give them horizon uh, depths, either in two-way travel time or in feet or meters, and um, uh, some ideas as to how the basin formed and its uh, temperature history, they can calculate where oil and gas will be generated. If I am above this dotted green line, there's not enough temperature and pressure for the kinetics to kick in so that molecules uh, of oil and gas will be generated. So above the green line, we would call that area immature in terms of hydrocarbon and oil uh, generation. Between green and red, the uh, temperature pressure burial is such that we will generate primarily oil with a minor amount of gas. The amount of oil that we're going to generate is dependent somewhat on the character of the source material. Uh, below the red line, we have reached a, a condition where all the oil that will be generated has been generated, and then we only generate gas. So from the red to the black line, we're in an area where we get only gas generation. And below the black line is where it is so hot, so deep, so pressurized that no more hydrocarbon will be generated. So we talk about the immature zone, the oil window, the gas window, and the overmature window. So if we're analyzing this basin, one of the first things we might be interested in, do I have any source rocks? And so in brown, I have uh, color-coded uh, intervals that uh, I believe will be uh, rich enough in organic material that it will generate oil and gas. I'm excited about these two brown layers because they're within the oil window. And so even present day, they're generating oil with a little bit of gas. I'm still excited about this brown. Presently, it's in the gas window and only generating gas. But to get to this depth of geological history, it had to pass through the oil window. So it has generated a lot of oil and some gas. I'm not too excited about the source rock on the right side of the slide for two reasons. One, it's pretty thin. And two, it has not reached the state of uh, temperature and pressure so that the kinetics have kicked in. And so all of the organic material in there, uh, none of it has been converted yet into oil or into gas. The other thing I'm interested in is where my reservoir quality rocks are located. And I show that in yellow. Uh, I, again, I'm excited on the left side because I have a source reservoir sandwich over here. And uh, looking ahead a little bit, uh, it looks like we can get things trapped where the sands pinch out against basement. Uh, the deeper sand uh, may not be of interest to me because it's going to be so hot that uh, if it had any hydrocarbons in it, uh, it's going to be cooked and uh, broken down. And uh, I might have some gas above the black line, but I would not have uh, any hydrocarbons below the black line. I also have the possibility for some uh, oil to get into some of these sands. I have to remember this is a single cross section. And as I look at different cross sections in this particular basin, there may, may be cases where I have mature source juxtaposed across a fault with a potential reservoir then I'd have to ask myself, can hydrocarbons get through that fault zone 
or would the fault zone be sealing in terms of allowing fluid to cross through it? I have to look for traps. So I have uh, one, two, three anticlines here. I have a pinch out. This would be a combination trap. There's a structural component because there's dip. There's a stratigraphic component because there's a pinch out. And so uh, I'm considering three play elements here, source, reservoir, trap, and I'll assume that above the reservoirs, I have a good seal. So that's my fourth um, uh, play element. The fifth play element is hydrocarbon migration. And so it's not hard for me to uh, believe and to sell to management that oil generated in the brown source rocks have been able to migrate and get into the yellow sands and been trapped uh, against the uh, pinch out of the sands on the far left. I may be able to uh, uh, work some details and get some confidence that there's been some cross fault migration, uh, some cross fault migration here. And if I'm a real optimist, I might say that I've generated oil in this position, it's moved up this fault, and it's charged this uh, small anticline in the shallower sand. If I look at the scale, this is a kilometer. It looks like what I'm saying on this diagram is hydrocarbons moved up a fault. Uh, a distance of one kilometer. And so someone might say, well, is that reasonable? And I would say most uh, certainly it is. In the Gulf of Mexico, we have uh, oil in Pliocene and Pleistocene reservoirs that were sourced in Jurassic source rocks that are at a depth of 20,000 feet. So uh, one kilometer worth of vertical uh, hydrocarbon migration is not unreasonable. If this is a uh, new basin that hasn't been drilled, we could then start making predictions where I might see oil, which is the green, and where I might see gas, which is the red. In this trap on the far left, I have a gas column and an oil leg. Again, the gas molecules are least in density, and so they're most buoyant. They rise to the top of the structure. Oil is intermediate in its density, and water or brine is the most dense. So it's kind of like a salad dressing that hasn't been stirred up recently. We get a separation of uh, air in the top of the um, uh, bottle, uh, uh, the oil floating on top of the vinegar. So uh, those are the five main important uh, parameters, source reservoir trap seal migration. Those are the things that any explorationist worries about all the time. There are five other components that we worry about. One is timing. Did the trap form, was it in existence at the time or before the hydrocarbon started to migrate through the basin? Another question is fill and spill. Has the volume of hydrocarbon that's been generated exceeded the uh, volume of the trap? So if I have a trap that can hold, let's say, uh, 50 million barrels of oil, but I generated 75 million barrels of oil, that means the trap can be filled and 25 million barrels excess will spill and move up the migration uh, pathway, possibly to another trap. If there has been spillage, uh, can I understand what that spillage is from one trap to another trap? And oil is always more valuable to us than gas. And so it comes down to a question of where is the oil? And again, uh, in uh, about a minute or so, I'll uh, talk about this uh, a bit more. The uh, third of the uh, secondary uh, components that we worry about is preservation. Has oil that has uh, been trapped in the reservoir been degraded in some fashion? And that uh, oil degradation can occur in two methods. One, by thermal degradation. Uh, if the reservoir gets too hot, the longer oil chains will crack, and eventually they'll get down to uh, uh, methane or gas. The other possibility is the reservoir is too cool, Bacteria can get into the uh, reservoir 
and they'll start to uh, chomp on the longer chained uh, hydrocarbon molecules. And uh, what they will leave behind is something that you would not mind putting on the surface where your car or uh, truck drives, but you wouldn't want to put it in your gas tank. So we talk about uh, biodegraded oil or heavy oil. Uh, this is uh, getting close to being tar. So let's talk about hydrocarbon fill and spill. Uh, Rube has uh, lent me his cauldron, and so we have uh, organic material that's getting cooked. The yellow band is meant to be an interval that has good porosity and permeability. That will be my migration route and also my reservoir rock. And we're going to assume that above the yellow, there's a uh, fantastic seal. So as hydrocarbons are generated, they'll percolate up, move up dip to the top of trap A. Uh, again, buoyancy is the mechanism. And that hydrocarbon will fill trap A down, 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 down to the level with the dotted black line. Uh, this is a low point in the syncline. We call it a synclinal spill point. If hydrocarbon is filled to this level and I keep adding hydrocarbon, it will find that it can rise higher along the migration path and get to trap B. And then trap B will fill with hydrocarbon down, 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 down to this dotted black line. That's where the top of the reservoir is uh, cut by a fault. If this a fault will allow hydrocarbons to leak through it and migrate up, then that would control how much uh, the maximum fill level for trap B would be. So let's say we've uh, done our studies here. We think we understand the burial and temperature history, and we believe our source rock is in the early, early oil generation window. It's generating mostly oil with a little bit of gas. And so we're generating oil and gas, and I show in trap A that it's about half filled with green, and my convention is that uh, green is oil. Uh, why isn't there any red shown here? Uh, the oil is able to dissolve a certain amount of gas, and so if there's not an excess of gas, we will not have a gas cap. We will have just oil with some dissolved uh, gas within it. So if this is my best idea, my best model for this particular basin, we would obviously want to drill trap A and obviously we would not want to drill trap B since there's no hydrocarbon in trap B. Let's say that uh, we are doing some sensitivity analysis. What if the basin is a little older and a little hotter? Maybe our source has gotten through the oil window and is just getting into the gas window. It's generating so much gas that all the gas can't be held in solution within the oil and so I form a free gas cap, which is indicated by the red. And as I continue to add oil and gas, I'm going to spill hydrocarbons. Because the gas is more buoyant, the gas is preferentially going to be trapped. And what I am going to spill is primarily oil, perhaps with a tiny bit of dissolved gas. This spilled oil will move up, and I have a second trap, trap B, and so trap B is going to fill, and it is going to be almost entirely filled with oil. So if I thought this was the most likely uh, situation for this basin, uh, would I drill trap A or would I drill, drill trap B? Uh, I've done this a number of times and some people say, well, drill trap B because it's, it's shallower and you don't need as much pipe. Well, let's say uh, this uh, trap is at 15,000 feet and this is at 16,000 feet, so the cost of pipe isn't really a main factor. Sometimes I get an answer, drill trap B because it's only oil. The correct answer here is drill trap A, perhaps not at the crest, but perhaps down dip from the crest. I, uh, sorry about the phone call. Um, the reason for that is if these were conical shaped traps 
and this thickness of green is the same as this thickness of green. Volumetrically, there's three times the amount of oil down here as there is up here. And so if this was 50 million barrels, this would be 150 million barrels. And if I went to management and said, let's drill this 50 million barrel potential field first, uh, they probably wouldn't be very happy uh, if they knew I, I had the possibility for three times that volume down dip. Let's say we do some more sensitivity analysis and we say, well, what if this is really a hot basin? The source is now fully in the uh, oil window, and so it's stopped generating, uh, I'm sorry, it's fully in the gas window. It stopped generating oil. It's generated so much gas that all of the oil has been flushed out of trap A, and oil and gas have spilled into trap B. Trap B is filled down to this fault leak point, and so excess is moving up. And as uh, I talked about in trap A, uh, the gas will form a gas cap in trap B and then have an oil leg. And as we add more hydrocarbon, primarily gas, to trap B, it's primarily oil that will leak up the fault. So one of the things that we commonly do in uh, prospecting is to consider what some of the different possibilities are so we have a range of possible outcomes. If I believe this was the current day situation, and let's say I'm only interested in oil, I'm not interested in gas, then we would not drill trap A. We would drill trap B. Hopefully we make a discovery. And if we find oil down to the fault spill point, the next thing a good explorationist would do is ask the question, is there spilled oil that can be found further up dip is there a trap C that may be the best trap of the three? So um, play elements are the five main things that I've uh, talked about, source reservoir, trap seal, and migration. If we can map all of these five, then we can, de can determine where we have the best likelihood to find oil and gas. So let's make some maps of the source rock, where they exist, where they might be generating oil only, where they might be generating oil and gas in combination, where they might be drilling, generating only gas. Let's see if we can make some maps that shows us where the uh, reservoir quality rocks were deposited. Let's see if we can locate uh, some potential traps, structural traps or stratigraphic traps or combination traps. And then can we make some deductions about possible migration pathways into those traps where we have reservoir quality rocks being fed hydrocarbons, uh, oil and gas, and hopefully uh, trapped uh, by a overlying seal. So then we can decide if there's a particular basin that we might be interested in, and perhaps we're interested in the uh, southeast corner of the basin, or maybe the west part of the basin. That would help us to figure out which blocks that might be up for bid we would uh, uh, be most interested in, the ones that have the greatest promise. And if we have some blocks and we're thinking about where should we drill an uh, exploration uh, well, uh, then looking at the different play elements and how they combine can give us an idea where uh, the best place to drill uh, an um, uh, exploration or a discovery well would be. We can also use the same type of analysis uh, if we've made a discovery and we're trying to figure out how to develop a field or in the production phase, how best to deplete that field. So uh, along with lecture two, there's an exercise number two. We won't get into too much of that, but it is available on the website. In this exercise, we have a hypothetical basin, the Bonanza Basin, and there are eight blocks that are up for bid. And so the uh, purpose of the exercise is to figure out which of these blocks uh, might be of interest to our company. And so, you are given in the exercise some maps about the source and the reservoir, uh, the trap, the migration, and we assume that the seal is uh, perfect everywhere. 
and so you're trying to decide if our company should um, uh, do some additional work preparing for a lease sale and perhaps bidding on uh, two of the blocks, four of the blocks, six of the blocks, or none of the blocks. So that com complete, uh, completes the uh, lecture and my prepared uh, statements. Uh, we should have uh, about 20 minutes and I'll try to answer questions. Uh, Danielle will um, uh, be feeding me those questions from uh, questions that were sent in using the chat uh, feature. Right. And if you haven't sent in a question, but you do have one, uh, you have time to submit a question now. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Fred. Um, so somebody has a question particularly on slide uh, number 19 um, about how gas would migrate down to the sand reservoir in the far left in the gas window. Like, okay, very good. Okay. I, Got it. okay, excellent. I know, I know exactly what uh, is causing that because this does seem to be counterintuitive. And there is a situation under which this could happen the hydrocarbon migration is really controlled by pressure differentials. And in most cases, uh, that is going to cause uh, vertical migration. But if the uh, brown sa uh, shales here are overpressured and the sands are normally pressured, there could be enough of a pressure drive to force the oil or gas to move uh, against gravity and uh, charge a uh, reservoir that is deeper than itself. Um, there are a few cases where we are able to fingerprint. We know where the hydrocarbons have come from in terms of the source. And the only way to explain how the uh, reservoir uh, oil or gas got there was to call upon a pressure drive causing the hydrocarbon to move against gravity. Hmm. OK. Okay, because yeah, somebody also had a question about the question mark um, in this about um, if that was related to the trap and if that meant that the trap was probably empty. No, the question mark uh, was meant to imply that that's a very risky assumption that hydrocarbons are going to move deeper. Hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. And, it, and again, it has to, it would have to be a pressure drive that would counter the, the gravity drive. Okay. Okay. Very observant uh, of a couple of you. <laughs> yeah. So this is in uh, regards to like the trap A versus trap B um, and why you didn't take into account water when you were talking about migration. Uh, well, we assume that the water uh, is in the uh, pore space in the, in the rocks as uh, kind of the default. And so as in this uh, slide 21, the first part of it, uh, water or brine would be everywhere where the yellow is. And since the oil is more buoyant than the water or brine, it will displace the water. And so you could say that the water is migrating out of the uh, crest of trap A. Mm. Okay. Um. There were two questions, I think, maybe to more clearly define something. Um, it, basically, how do you define the boundary between the oil and the and gas window? Sure. Yeah. Um, OK. Um, the um, geochemistry behind the oil and the gas window is uh, uh, linked to what are called Arrhenius equations. And so there's a series of geochemical equations that have been developed over uh, decades that tells us for a given source rock with a certain organic content and a certain organic type, when will oil molecules start to generate? When will gas molecules start to generate? And so those equations have been built into the geochemical software that does the modeling where uh, oil is generated uh, or the oil window is located, where the gas window is uh, is located. And so it goes back to um, 
the um, uh, ages of these units that I have, uh, what sort of uh, burial path did they have, what sort of uh, heat flow is this area uh, subjected to, and so all of those inputs, uh, the ages, the depths, the paleo water depth, the uh, paleo surface temperature, um, uh, organic matter type, organic matter uh, uh, percent, all goes into the equations to make these types of predictions. And since we don't know all of those equations, uh, all, uh, all of those parameters perfectly, there are always error bars associated with uh, where these uh, boundaries for the different windows are. That's why most companies don't do a single model, but they do a series of models and try to get an understanding of what the range of possibilities uh, can be. Speaking of the range of possibilities, what is like the range for um, what you would expect, like percentage-wise, of um, hydrocarbon discovery when all play elements are in place? That's one of the questions. Um, <laughs> if, if we look at if we look at exploration wells today, uh, wells that would be considered wildcat. Uh, worldwide, the average uh, success rate is about 33%. So one, one out of three tend to be successful. Uh, the ones that don't uh, are not successful uh, uh, are associated with either one of the play, one or more of the play elements not being present or in the condition that uh, it was believed to be, or it could be that some hydrocarbon is in the trap uh, but it's not enough to be economic. Hmm. So um, in the, you know, it, when I started in the late 70s, our success rate wasn't quite so high. Uh, it might have been about uh, 20 or 25 percent. Uh, as our technology has matured, as we've gotten better seismic images, as we've gotten 3D seismic, as our geochemical models have gotten better, our ability to predict, predict uh, sand uh, porosity permeability have gotten better. Uh, we've been able to go from about a, let's say a, a 25% success rate up to 30, uh, 35, 40. Uh, there is a topic called uh, amplitude versus offset AVO uh, further along in this series. Uh, that is where the geophysics is uh, uh, a friend to the explorationist, uh, we can get certain types of responses looking at amplitude versus offset on the seismic data. And in those cases, sometimes we have about a 95% success rate. Mm -hmm. So um, the success rate depends on how nice the uh, geophysics works out in a particular area. Okay, yeah, sure. Um... So I'm going to try to, there's quite a few questions about this particular particular slide, Fred, so I'm going to try to lump them together as much as possible. Um, one of the questions are why um, are the lines that you've dotted across the screen, the green, the red, and the black, um, why are they not perfectly horizontal? Um, there seem to be some pull-ups like the, the broken red line, but I'm thinking the broken red line is probably related to the fault. Is that true? Yes, well, these lines are based on the um, the uh, burial, well, the age, the burial, the temperature, the pressure. And so if we're in the syncline, uh, let's say this uh, kind of light green, it's at a much deeper depth than the light green is up here. So the lines are not going to follow the stratigraphic horizons, and they're also not going to follow uh, pure depth slices uh, as well. Uh, it's a combination of all those different parameters and this is this is just a diagrammatic um, uh, uh, illustration so I wouldn't put uh, too much uh, weight into how I drew those uh, those wiggly lines. Right. Um, also regarding the slide, does this um, kind of model also assume an oil water contact? The oil water contact uh, doesn't come into the oil window and the gas window. Uh, once, once I have a a situation such as this, uh, 
the gas water contact would be where this occurs and not based on a prediction but based on uh, drilling results and the oil water contact would be here and another oil water contact would be here so those contacts are based on how full or uh, how if, if a particular trap is only partially filled or uh, filled to a particular control point and by control point uh, one would be a synclinal spill point that controls how much hydrocarbon trap a can hold and a fault leak point that controls how much hydrocarbon trap B can hold. Okay, great. Um, kind of keeping on like the liquid parts, um, what is the best geophysical technique to monitor the liquid migration path? The migration path itself is very difficult to uh, detect uh, uh, from the surface uh, with seismic or with any other type of data. Uh, migration can occur in uh, layers that are just a few centimeters thick. Occasionally we'll have situations where uh, oil or gas in the migration pathway outside of where it's trapped will have enough of a change of the seismic impedance of the rocks that they will have an anomalous amplitude. But that is a, is a pretty rare occurrence, and certainly if you see that we call those uh, hydrocarbon flags, if we see those flags, um, that helps us to understand. Yes, there's been high hydrocarbon migration, and the paths uh, may still be active. But if we don't see the flags, it does not really uh, detract from a, a prospect, uh, a place where we're thinking about drilling. Um, now we have quite a few questions that are about specific um, portions of, you know, the five play elements. Um, the first is, can we mark source rock on seismic even if it's lying deep? Uh, typically, source rocks don't have a, uh, an unusual characteristic in terms of seismic. Uh, sometimes it does have low density and you can get anomalous seismic responses. Uh, coals can uh, generate uh, usually uh, mostly gas, and sometimes we can detect coal seams on seismic if they're thick enough and the density is low enough. Typically what we'll do is, uh, from our regional studies, we'll understand the uh, location in the geological column of where the source rocks are, are and then through our seismic interpretation and our, our predicting of ages, uh, we'll know where, let's say, the uh, Kimmeridgian uh, section is. Uh, the Kimmeridgian is uh, globally an excellent source rock. And so we would be interested in modeling what sort of uh, depth of burial and temperature and pressure history that particular uh, interval uh, on our seismic has undergone. Okay. Um, how, so we have a question on how do you reconcile shale rocks being a seal in conventional plays and at the same time a source reservoir rock in unconventional plays? Yeah, the, sh the shale has uh, usually low permeability and that's why in unconventional plays Typically, we can't produce hydrocarbons unless we stimulate the rock in some fashion. And so uh, if we have a you know, porous permeable sand or carbonate and it's capped by a shale, uh, the physics involved in um, getting fluids out of the uh, bigger pores into the smaller pores are such that we have the potential to, to uh, trap a uh, fair uh, thickness of oil or gas, uh, even with a fairly thin layer of shale. Mm -hmm. The um, the thing that made uh, unconventional so rev revolutionary is that uh, prior to 15 or 20 years ago, no one thought we would ever be able to extract oil and gas from shales. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I mentioned in lesson one, 
the uh, revolution in horizontal drilling and fracking uh, has uh, unleashed the our ability to uh, tap into oil and gas that are in, that are in low permeability shales and also low permeability sands. Okay. Um, I have a question about the fault um, and how we know that that could be acting as a seal. So how do we know that? Uh, knowing whether a fault is uh, a, a barrier, a seal, or it allows the transmissions of hydrocarbon is a very important and a very difficult question. I believe I'll talk a bit about that uh, when we talk about uh, migration and seal. Uh, there are methods that we use to take stratigraphy and model what has been juxtaposed against what, what has been rubbed against what as the fault has moved, and we'll estimate how much uh, shale uh, should be in the fault gouge. And uh, empirically, we know that if the uh, percentage shale is above a certain percentage, then uh, uh, historically it tends to be sealing. And if it's uh, less than a certain percentage, then uh, to be uh, leaking. The other thing that we can do is if we have either through wells or through seismic uh, determined how far down dip a particular field is filled, we can then look for what controls that. And sometimes it's the presence of a fault, like on this slide, trap B. Um, if we know that the hydrocarbon is limited at that depth, then it's uh, fairly uh, safe to assume that the hydrocarbons can leak up that fault zone. Great. Um, so I guess the final question to kind of wrap up the whole play is how, when can, when do scientists and, and engineers in the oil and gas industry, when do they def call that a play is finally like a lead and that they're going to move on from the modeling and go for it? Uh, uh, working a lead into a prospect, into drilling it, um, most of that is done by geoscientists as opposed to engineers. Uh, not to say that engineers aren't uh, uh, asked to contribute some information. Uh, we are, uh, the explorationists are always looking for places where they drill. And so they will do uh, some initial work to uh, figure out where the leads are. And then uh, they'll do a lot of extra work to mature the lead into what we would call a prospect, something we're ready to show management as a potential place to drill. So it's in that analysis, that maturing of a lead to a prospect, that we have to ask questions uh, such as, is there a source that's been generating a significant amount of oil? Is there a trap that uh, we have a good degree of confidence exists? Uh, what would be the controlling factor on that trap? Uh, is it uh, reasonable to assume migration pathways from the source in into the uh, reservoir in the trap? How effective might the seal be? And so we'll go through all of those questions. Uh, typically, we look for the weakest link uh, in a particular basin. Maybe there's uh, plenty of source rocks and there's plenty of reservoir rocks and it doesn't have many sealing lithologies. And so uh, seal would be hit harder in terms of analyses than, uh, than source and reservoir might be hit. And um, it's when the team that's working the, the lead uh, and maybe their uh, direct uh, supervisor manager are comfortable to present that to management as ready to be drilled, that uh, the decision is made, yes, we're ready to, to move on to the stage where we, um, we trust our predictions enough that we're going to uh, drill a, a three or four million dollar well to see if we're, we were right. Great. Thank you, Fred. Um, I've noticed what time it's getting. Um, there are several other questions that are going to be, uh, that were asked. Um, so what I will say is that, and I think it's kind of like different from the particular topics we've been talking about right now. Um, I will say that 
after the webinar is finished, I do forward everyone's questions to Fred. And what Fred has done is picked the most commonly asked questions out of that group or the most interesting in his opinion, um, at, you know, at times, um, but answers a handful of questions that were un unable to be answered or that he wants to answer more fully in that document. And as Fred walked us through how to find this information in class, um, once Fred and I have discussed about what the answers, you know, best look like um, for um, for the website, uh, those will be posted. So if some of you, I, I saw that one was asked about conventional versus unconventional and things like that, and I definitely remember that that was a question that Fred had in his lesson one um, FAQs. So um, Fred, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> no, I'm just uh, happy to uh, be able to do this. I'm uh, excited about the number of people that have been uh, tuning in to uh, to catch the live webinars. Yeah. So my my apologies that we're unable to answer everyone's questions, but um, all of your questions are then sent to Fred, um, as well as your email contact information, so that um, if you know there's something that seems like very to stand out. Um, yeah, so that's not going to be for everybody. There's too much going on <laughs> with all 34 of these lessons, but um, you know, find uh, you can find these webinars on YouTube or through um, the in class that um, Fred mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. So, with that, that completes lesson two. Uh, please stay tuned for lesson three, um, which will be um, this Thursday, June fifteenth, from two to three p.m. Um, Eastern Daylight Time. Um, and we'll, he'll be talking about tools of the trade. So please be on the lookout for that. Uh, so with that, this webinar is finished and see you on Thursday. All right. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.